Hello everyone, this is Jack Wiest from Intel and I'm here to talk about uh, paving a path to commercial scale of automated vehicles. And specifically, I think there's something interesting about the intersection of industry standards in the development of regulatory frameworks. So let's dive in. First, uh, let's think about our, our friends in government. They're in a tight spot. Uh, on the one hand, you have the industry uh, pushing uh, to allow for commercial and wide-scale deployment of automated vehicle technologies. Uh, but on the other hand, government is getting squeezed and pressured from groups that are concerned, sometimes justly so, about the safety of the technology. And so this is what makes this a challenge for governments who are stuck in the middle. Um, but let's dig a little deeper to understand why is this problem so hard? So think for a minute uh, a question. What if every automated vehicle on the road had its own definition of what it meant to drive safely? What if every state in the US or country in Europe had a different definition of what it meant uh, to drive safely? Or what if every time there was an accident involving an automated vehicle, uh, it took a lawsuit and years of litigation to figure out ultimately who was the one that was driving safely and who was not? Um, but this is the current state of the world right now. We know what it means to drive safely as a human, and we kind of know it when we see it. Uh, but machines, you know, need explicit definitions and instruction. Uh, and we don't yet have such definition. And so this is the real challenge for the industry and for all of us who care about the safety benefits of this technology, which is that unless we can come to an agreement on what it means for an automated vehicle to drive safely, there likely will not be automated vehicles. Companies will significantly constrain and limit their deployment, will remain under these test exemptions, um, and a significant portion of the people around the world will not enjoy the life-saving benefits of this technology. So let's propose a definition then. What does driving safely mean? Well, we, we assert driving safely means to drive at a societally acceptable risk balance and prove that you're doing so. And this definition works for humans. When we take a driver's test, what are we doing? We're demonstrating that we understand how to drive. And this is not just explicit traffic rules, things like speed limits and stop signs, but it's also how we drive, what's societally acceptable in terms of the behavior of, of us as a human driver. And so we think it's fair for machines to share this same definition. Um, so how can we break this down though? Uh, humans, when we think about driving safely, uh, we have rules like the two second rule, things that we use where you count the number of seconds after the vehicle in front of you passes a certain marker on the side of the road. And that's supposed to kind of give you a good judge of am I following at a safe distance or really at a societally acceptable difference, distance because what is societally unacceptable? A tailgater, right? And so these kinds of rules uh, prevent us from behaving badly. Um, but this is all we can do, you know, for our uh, imperfect brains. And so, but with machines and with automated vehicles, we have a better way. We don't have to guess, uh, we can be precise. And so this is a formula from the responsibility sensitive safety model uh, that was released by Mobileye back in 2017. You don't need to know the details behind it other than to know that at the end of the day, uh, this is physics. We have lots of laws in the world that we're hoping to change and improve to enable the widespread uh, deployment of automated vehicle technology. Uh, but there are laws of physics that we're not gonna change anytime soon. And so we have objects of mass in motion and you can parameterize that and you can create a formula that gives you a very precise calculation of what is the minimum distance I need to have from the automated vehicle to a vehicle that it's following to make sure there is sufficient distance to stop if the vehicle in front were to suddenly break. So it's pretty straightforward at the end of the day. But here's the trick. Not all of these parameters can be measured or known. There's a variety of parameters here. We have velocity, we have uh, response time, you know, things like this. Um, but one of these parameters, beta max, represents an assumption. It represents an assumption about what should I expect the maximum braking capability of that vehicle that I'm following is. And that's a really good question because the greater the braking capability of the vehicle that you're following, the more distance that you're going to need to make sure that you can stop without crashing into the rear of that leading vehicle. And here's where it gets tricky. So if you just look at a sampling of vehicles on the road, cars on the road today have very different maximum braking capabilities. If you're lucky enough to have a Porsche or a Corvette, you've got a car that can brake with two and a half meters per second. If you're driving a large truck, 
because of the size and weight of that vehicle, uh, it, its braking capability might be a bit less. Interestingly, NHTSA found that it doesn't matter actually what kind of vehicle humans drive. When a human is driving, they generally brake with about six and a half meters per second squared uh, with a pretty small standard deviation. And so here's the question. Should we choose and ask these machines to assume the theoretical worst case? And that might be 15, 20, could be 30 meters per second uh, because somebody somewhere has got a, a race car that's been licensed to, to go on the road. If you do that, what's going to happen? Automated vehicles are going to have incredibly long following distances. They'll contribute negatively to traffic flow. They'll reduce the throughput of our roadways and generally just annoy all of us human drivers that are probably still going to be on the road as well. So on the other hand, if we choose a naturalistic value, for example, six and a half meters per second, or even just seven, uh, you're going to get a car that fits into traffic flow, uh, does not negatively contribute uh, to congestion, but is a vehicle that has a non-zero chance that it will get into a crash if that vehicle it's following were to brake greater than that assumed maximum braking capability. And so this is what makes this, cha this a challenging question because ultimately safety is a, a balance between safety and usefulness. The safest automated vehicle would be the one that never leaves the garage. Uh, so the act of driving is inherently uh, has risk. And so how to quantify that risk and how to define what is acceptable risk is our challenge. And so here we have responsibilities. So industry definitely has a responsibility here to define these parameters. What are these parameters by which these machines will operate with uh, that govern how they will behave? Uh, but ultimately, we think it's government's role uh, to pick the values. And you might think, well, government's not going to do this, um, but government actually does this all the time. Every time a new road is built, what happens? You have a, a speed limit. That speed limit is a parameter, and the value represents acceptable risk for that roadway. If we wanted to eliminate fatal accidents from all roads around the world overnight, we could set the maximum speed limit to be 10 miles per hour. It'd be incredible for safety. Fatalities and car accidents would be a thing of the past. But why don't we do that? Because of the loss of efficiency and utility of our transportation network. So a speed limit is a great example of a number, a value that represents a balance between safety and usefulness. And so in other words, represents acceptable risk. There are other new regulations that are coming around electric vehicles. Uh, for example, um, when an electric vehicle is operating below a certain speed, it's going to be required to emit a sound. We've probably all experienced that with electric vehicle that kind of creeps up out of nowhere uh, in a parking lot or something. Well, at some point, those vehicles will all emit a sound. And the regulation says 62 decibels. Well, why 62? Why wasn't it 63, 65, 70? Wouldn't 80 decibels or 90 decibels be better for safety? Wouldn't more people hear the car, especially you know, kids with earbuds in? Well, for sure, but at what cost? The cost of our hearing, the cost of annoying people who are anywhere within earshot of this incredibly loud uh, sound. And so a trade-off is made, a balance uh, is achieved uh, where a level of acceptable risk is identified and a value is selected uh, to represent that acceptable risk. And so we have the same concept then for automated vehicles. And so here's where industry standards come in to help. This is a challenge for our friends in government and we do want to help. Uh, and industry is proud uh, to be leading IEEE 2846, uh, which is a new standard uh, titled Assumptions for Models in Safety-Related Automated Vehicle Behavior. And in this standard, we have an incredible collection of entities. I'm honored to have uh, Waymo uh, as our vice chair, Aurora as our secretary, and I humbly from Intel, I'm sharing this group. Uh, but we have automakers from around the world. We have mobility as a service players. We have tier ones. We have uh, research entities. We have government entities like NIST are participating. So it's an incredible collection of one of the most diverse group of industry players in the automated vehicle space, all coming together to solve this problem. So what are we doing in this standard? In this standard, uh, we are defining assumptions that are present in common scenarios that must be considered 
by the automated vehicle. So let's take that car following scenario that we saw before. You've got the automated vehicle, it's following another car, you need to figure out some sort of what safe distance. Uh, and so what is the assumption? It's an assumption about the maximum assumed longitudinal deceleration. We formulated that as a regular expression, um, at, as we said before, uh, where you need to assume a maximum braking capability of that vehicle that you're following. Let's look at a more complicated scenario. Uh, here's a pedestrian. Humans have much more interesting kinematic properties. Um, and so for pedestrians, uh, but you also need to make assumptions. What should we assume is the maximum longitudinal velocity of a pedestrian? Are we talking about an Olympic athlete here? Are we talking about a regular human? What if there's a pedestrian that's occluded behind a parked uh, moving truck or something? Uh, what should I assume the maximum possible acceleration is of that pedestrian? Uh, what about the heading angle and the heading angle rate change? When we're human drivers, we often drive on roads that are 30, 35, 45 miles per hour right next to a sidewalk, which is incredibly unsafe if you think about it, but, but it works. Why does it work? Because we make an assumption. We assume if that pedestrian is on the sidewalk, they're going to stay on the sidewalk. What gives us intuitively uh, an insight into whether that pedestrian is staying on that sidewalk? Their heading angle. Which, is, which direction is their pose, as well as what we know intuitively about how fast can a human stop on a dime, as the saying goes. And so these are all additional assumptions that can be baked into safety models that are inside automated vehicles to make sure that they can navigate safely uh, around other road users. So if we break this problem down from a, from a government and a societal perspective, uh, we think it's critical that vehicle level performance targets be set. Um, if you break it down, and that just simply crashes. So we'd like these vehicles to be at least as good, if not better than humans, of course, right? So we need to set what is an acceptable performance uh, for these vehicles. And if you break that down, that can be bro broken down into two parts. Uh, how might you then have a crash? You might have a crash because you had some sort of failure. Uh, in the hardware or software system. Fortunately, we have an excellent standard ISO 26262 uh, that can help mitigate against that. Next, you could add algorithmic failures. So everything's operating fine from, let's say, a hardware standpoint, uh, but there might have been an error in the logic or there might be misuse. Uh, that fortunately is covered by ISO 21448. Uh, and then if you break it down even further, if you use formal models uh, for planning, Formal models can help ensure that the automated vehicle will always make the right driving decision. And so then that further reduces the scope of the problem to perception. So perception then is the largest contributor to the failure rate. IEEE 2846 fits in because it provides those boundaries for what is reasonably foreseeable behavior about other road users. In other words, what is reasonable for me to assume uh, that I could expect from other drivers, other pedestrians, other cyclists, uh, things like that. And so that's why this standard is so important because it provides clarity to industry on what should the automated vehicle be able to handle and what is reasonably foreseeable to expect. And then with that, combined with vehicle level performance targets, uh, industry can deliver an incredibly safe vehicle. So a path forward then for governments. The first thing is governments should specify near-term performance metrics. And we say near-term because right now we're living in a vacuum. There are no performance metrics that are specified at all. Uh, so I know we can debate this question of how safe is safe enough, but if you don't set any target at all, uh, the level of safety is going to be the lowest common denominator, which likely is not going to be acceptable uh, to society. So it is much better for government to set a performance target. It can always change over time than to say nothing at all. Uh, the second is um, uh, set that in relation to human drivers. So it's important to think about the comparative performance, um, you know, because not all scenarios are the same. Driving in snow is very different than driving in dry weather, for example. Different kinds of roads and conditions have different levels of safety, even for human drivers. So we should think about this problem as a comparative analysis to how well is the vehicle performing compared to human drivers. That also allows for cultural differentiation because of different driving styles and different levels of human driver safety around the world. 
Next, uh, we need government to help us by defining those values, picking those numbers, just like that speed limit, just like that sound uh, for electric vehicles to emit. What are the values that represent acceptable risk uh, and define what is reasonably foreseeable behavior about other road users? And then finally, we do support, uh, as NHTSA recently uh, called out in their ANPRM, technology neutral process and engineering measures. Things like formal models can help transparently define for everyone to see what constitutes driving safely for an automated driving system. So here's our call to action. Industry and government should continue to work together on standards like IEEE 2846 uh, and partner with government to align on what it means uh, to drive safely. From government, we need regulatory frameworks now. Clarity is important for industry. Lacking clarity uh, is not good for safety. And finally, uh, we need the research community to step up and help us understand methodologies for identifying these values that represent acceptable risk. And so together, if all of us can do this, then the future is bright for automated vehicles and society will enjoy this life-saving technology. So thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Welcome, Jack. Thanks for uh, joining us. Um, now, may I ask, will IEEE 2046 include suggested values that regulators could consider? It's an excellent question. Uh, as, as I mentioned in my talk, we think it's a really important role for the government uh, to pick those values because they represent sort of the will and desire of society in terms of what is acceptable risk. Um, however, industry is going to help. Uh, while our standard will not contain the values themselves, uh, the work group is working on a companion white paper to our standard that will contain a literature survey of existing research and studies uh, where values have been identified. Uh, so these might be naturalistic driving studies uh, or other research studies by academia and or governments around the world. Uh, so we do plan on publishing that as a companion to our standard to assist governments in this important role of identifying the values that represent acceptable risk. Mm. And our safety models like I don't know, Intel's RSS or Namibia SFF open and available for the industry to adopt into their self-driving programs? I can say certainly for the RSS model, uh, we are happy to have released an open source library uh, that you can download and, and grab on GitHub. Um, we've funded dozens of research papers uh, around the world. We've integrated the open source library into the open source uh, driving simulator called Carla. Uh, and so we really have encouraged uh, open uh, and transparent access and development around the responsibility sensitive safety model, which is I think one of the reasons why we've seen such wonderful support for it around the world. Um, because it's one thing for a company to say they have a safety model and mm -hmm. to say, trust me, it works, <laughs> it's safe. Uh, and it's something very different for that company then to publish all of the math, all of the code uh, and everything else behind it and say, look for yourselves, you know, and convince yourself. Uh, and so that's what we've been doing is we're committed uh, to transparency in the safety of our automated vehicles. And that starts with the safety model with RSS. Mm. And when do you expect IEEE P 2846 to be complete? and ready for regulators to use? Uh, the work group is working very hard. Uh, we just finished another major draft and we're hoping that uh, by this July or August, uh, that we will have a complete validated draft uh, that we will send up to our society sponsors within the IEEE for formal ratification. So certainly within this year, uh, and we're targeting just a bit later this summer. Uh, which is great timing if you think about it. Um, Germany is making outstanding progress from a regulatory standpoint. The European Commission has some excellent proposals. UNECE is also working very diligently. Uh, NHTSA recently released an ANPRM uh, for which many companies responded. And so we think uh, having our standard ready uh, by mid to late summer is perfect timing for all of those governments to be able to pick it up, reference it in regulation and provide those important values uh, for automated vehicles to use within their safety models. Mm, okay, so um, we have a, maybe just a last question, if that's okay with you. Um, do you see an international agreement on what constitutes, uh, constitutes uh, driving safely? Mm. Yeah, it's a fascinating question because 
this, this notion of driving safely is actually quite cultural. Uh, driving safely uh, to an Italian means something different than driving safely to a German, just like you drive differently in Shanghai as you would uh, in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, and so driving safely is cultural. Driving is cultural. Driving styles are cultural. Uh, and so that's why we think it's important to have a framework that's flexible, um, that can work around the world, um, but do so with different values. And that's what the 2846 standard and safety models like RSS allow you to do, is you can still have a verifiable safety assurance um, but governments can provide values uh, that affect the way the vehicles drive to make sure that the automated vehicles are driving in a culturally acceptable way. Uh, because as I said in my talk, driving safely uh, is driving at a societally acceptable risk balance and proving that you're doing so. So it's got to reflect the will of the people and the driving style uh, that's acceptable to the people who are going to be driving alongside these vehicles. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Um, I appreciate your time and your insights. Um, I see a um, couple of questions through um, coming through the audience. But if anyone wants to um, contact Jack for uh, any more questions, just please go to the exhibitor uh, hub and you can connect with um, Jack. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much, Jack.